Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. So let's look at the timescale events that we've covered so far. Around 4.6 billion years ago, Earth begins to accrete from the stellar nursery cloud where the sun forms. The sun forms from that region's mass. And the sun is most of the solar system. But the Earth begins to accrete with the sun and the rest of the planets around 4.6 billion years ago. By 4.5 billion years ago, Earth had begun to accrete as a large surviving planetary object, gaining mass as it sweeps clear its orbit of stray debris. From the interior of Earth, it begins to boil out a primordial atmosphere that would be composed of initially solar light volatiles, but hydrogen and helium are easily lost to space. We would have had initial atmosphere once the hydrogen bled away of retained helium. That eventually would bleed away. Nitrogen we kept, along with CO2, methane, ammonia, and other light volatiles like hydrogen sulfide and things like that. By 4.4 billion years ago, accretion was winding down, and most of the planet cores and large objects had been forming for a while. And at that point, one stray object hit Earth and caused the formation of our moon. This object called Thea was Mars-sized, Mars-massed, and it struck the Earth, turning both into a cloud of debris that settled back down to form Earth 2.0, if you want to call it that, and a debris ring that coalesced into the moon, forming Earth with a slightly larger metal core than it would have had otherwise, and the moon, which has almost no metal core and no light volatiles, and is dry as a bone. Now, what seems to happen next is interesting. The oldest rocks in the world that have been recovered are grains of, grains of rock from original rocks that had been weathered into small particles and carried away and deposited somewhere else. So these are grains of the mineral, a mineral called zircon. We can look at the uranium lead ratios in these crystals and determine their age and date them to about 4.375 billion years ago. So the zircons were covered from Jack Hills in Australia. And this is the Jack Hills, a part of it right here. These tiny bits of rock tell us a lot because they tell us from their own geochemistry, their oxygen isotopic ratios, for example, what the temperature of formation was when these crystals formed at the Earth's surface. And it turns out these things formed about 4.375 billion years ago in a temperature environment not too different from what we have today. Meaning that in just a few dozen million years after the moon formation event, the Earth's surface had cooled to the point where you could have liquid water. So it appears that after the moon formation, we didn't remain a seething magma inferno planet for millions and millions of, of years. We cooled fairly quickly, and the oceans condensed out, and geologic processes could continue. By about 4.3 billion years ago, the oceans have formed, they've condensed out of the atmosphere, the atmosphere has cooled. We would have had an atmosphere of primarily nitrogen, CO2, bits of methane, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, still. At this point, there aren't really any large continents. Early on like this, there would have been island chains, uh, maybe small proto-continents beginning to form, but no large continents, and most of the Earth would have appeared from space to be a water planet. As time goes on, by about 4.2 billion years ago, the Earth is still a water planet, but progressive geologic processes are converting some of the crustal basaltic rock into lighter silicates, and you're starting to form continental rock, and the continents are beginning to accrue. So about, by about 4.2 billion years ago, we expect that there were small island continents around the planet moving around tectonically. And the Earth continues to outgas carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, methane, ammonia from its interior, nitrogen, and the atmosphere continues to enrich with these materials as well as organics, organics that, organic compounds that were present in the accretionary material. That's also in the ocean, and we will talk about that later because that's relevant to the origins of life. So by 4.1 billion years ago, the Earth is cool, there are oceans, maybe small continents, organics in the ocean, perhaps life has already begun, perhaps not. We'll, we'll come back to that. Then something happens. You would expect accretion to trail away to nothing and eventually just be your random occasional small meteor hitting the Earth or something like that, or an asteroid striking the Earth every few million years. 
But around 4.1 to 4 billion years ago, something happened to change that. Earth started to be bombarded again intensely. It's called the late heavy bombardment. It was a dramatic increase in the you know, frequency of comet and asteroid impacts, massive impacts of whichever composition, into the Earth. And this continued till about 3.9, maybe 3.8 billion years ago and sort of trailed away. That needs an explanation. So how do we know that that even happened at all? How do we know that the late heavy bombardment occurred Occurred, any cratering from that time on Earth would have been long since gone to erosion. So we're not looking at our planet for the evidence for that. We're looking at the moon. Lunar samples returned by Apollo astronauts, some of them are some of the oldest rocks that indicate the age of the moon around 4.4 billion years, but there's a, a number of them that cluster around an age range of around 4.1 to 3.8 billion years, meaning that these are rocks from impacts, from, from igneous processes, that occurred all in this sort of narrow span of time. And the craters appear to be that old. So why so long after a collision, collisions should have trailed off after accretion, did uh, impacts suddenly loom back up again as a major issue? That's the question. The late heavy bombardment is an isolated episode of late impacting onto the planet. So there are many ideas as to why this happened. We see evidence on the moon, several of the large basins on the moon, the Nectaris, Imbrium, and Oriental basins, all seem to date from this period where they shouldn't. They're big impact basins. They should have formed much earlier. Nothing that big should be forming as impacts that late after accretion. So there are several hypotheses about how this works that have come and gone. A leading hypothesis proposes that late heavy bombardment might be the result of events occurring further out in the solar system. Around 4.1 billion years ago, accretion was over, but you don't necessarily get to assume that all the planets are in permanently stable orbits yet. The big outer planets, sometimes the math of how orbits subtly change over time takes time to play out. It appears that Jupiter and Saturn were in slightly different orbits then than they are than they are now. Jupiter and Saturn then perhaps entered what we call a 2-1 orbital resonance, meaning that for every one Jupiter orbit, Saturn goes around the Sun twice. So every second Saturn orbit, Jupiter and Saturn are on the same side of the Sun. To planets that are further out, the outer planets, Uranus and Neptune, that com combining of gravitational influences would have produced an occasional extra tug on their orbits, an extra spike in gravitational disturbance. And it seems that what eventually happened was that this resonance disturbed the orbit of Neptune, causing it to spiral out further from the Sun. In this model, Neptune actually formed closer to the Sun than Uranus, making Uranus the original outermost planet and Neptune having formed closer in between the orbits of Uranus and Saturn. And this is actually consistent with the geochemistry of the two planets, which I won't get into much here, but the composition of Neptune compared to the composition of Uranus and their temperatures indicate that they're in the wrong place, that Neptune should not have formed where it is, and in fact should have formed closer in. So that's another piece of evidence that's added to this. So anyway, what seems to have happened is that when Neptune moved out to a more distant orbit, it disturbed what was until then a fairly sizable population of small to medium Kuiper belt objects, icy objects like Pluto, in the outer reaches of the solar system beyond the orbit of Uranus, and mostly even today beyond the orbit of Neptune. This simulation illustrates the migration of Neptune and shows you visually what I'm trying to describe here. When Jupiter and Saturn combined gravitational influence and destabilize the orbit of Neptune, it moves outward. Neptune in this simulation is in the blue orbit, so pay attention to the blue orbit. Beyond that, these, this cloud of green material out beyond the orbit of, in this, the purple orbit of, of Uranus, presently. That green material is the Kuiper belt, it's, or at least the inner part of it. Let me proceed with this animation and we can see what happens. Watch what happens when Neptune's orbit moves outward. It suddenly changes positions, goes into an outer orbit, and scatters all that material. Now when that material scatters, what I mean by that is it's scattering inward and outward. Some of it's going to go into hyperbolic orbits that will leave the solar system. Some of it is going to, a lot of it, is going to fall inward toward the sun. The 
migration of Neptune scattered lots of cometary material from the outer solar system. And it would have come raining in over the next hundreds of millions of years. These are, some of these are long period slow orbits out there. So it takes a long time for this to play out. But over the next few hundred million years, the Earth would have been pelted with objects, sometimes big ones. And this is a major event in Earth's history. The Earth had settled down and was coalescing and chemically differentiating in its interior, and then this happens. And so this, in many ways, resets a lot of the processes that were already occurring on Earth. What I've set up here is a series of simulations that would depict broadly the results of impactors of various sizes striking the Earth during the late heavy bombardment. I'm going to start with a fairly small impactor, roughly the size of Ceres, the largest of the asteroids in the asteroid belt, a few hundred kilometers across, and what would be the effect of that striking the Earth? In this simulation, you can see immediately it creates a gigantic impact basin on the side of the Earth hit, and ejecta from that impact are being tossed around the planet to land in ballistic trajectories on the other side of the planet. And therefore you start creating lots more impact basins and a lot more disturbance. In this particular example though, the oceans survive. You'll note that there are areas where the oceans are probably boiling, but lots of stretches of the Earth's surface where it is relatively unaffected. Now let's look at what happens if you impact the Earth with something substantially larger, like something the size of Eris or Triton, a Kuiper Belt object a couple of thousand kilometers across. What would happen to the Earth if we were struck by something like that during late heavy bombardment? Because we may have been several times. Let's see. In this case, you can see the oceans are boiling. One impact from that object is enough to turn half the Earth into an impact basin. And the result heats the atmosphere up, heats the surface enough that the oceans are boiling away. In either case, the result of the late heavy bombardment would have been a seething Earth again. At least the surface would have been partially molten. But remember the oldest rocks in the world, the zircons found in the Jack Hills of Australia. They indicated that just after the moon formation event, the giant impact that formed the moon, the Earth, a few tens of millions of years later, was able to condense water to form oceans again. After the late heavy bombardment, the oceans would persist, and conditions became possible for life to emerge soon thereafter. But that's a story for another day.